Welcome back. Thank you very much for staying with us. Now, the ANC continued losing streak in case at end by elections. It lost Ward 11 of Umuzwa Bantu municipality to the IFP. This is why the Democratic Alliance calls for laws to govern coalitions and limit motions of no confidence. Let's talk local government elections and coalitions with public policy specialist TK Boer and local government elections analyst Wayne Sussman. Wayne, good morning and thank you very much for your time as well as you, TK. Good morning and thank you as well for your time. Very interesting developments, perhaps to start with you, Wayne. Very interesting developments that we've seen with the by-elections, particularly in case at 10. Just take us through some of those results. Sure. So just to put Umuzi Wabantu in perspective, this is in southern KwaZulu-Natal. Now, traditionally, the IFP did well in northern KwaZulu-Natal, places like Ulundi, Nongoma, etc. But Jacob Zuma, his great gift to the ANC was how southern KwaZulu-Natal, uh, this was pure ANC heartland country. The ANC really ran up the numbers. I'll give you some numbers. In 2016, the ANC won 70% of the seats in Umuzi Wabantu, which is around the Harding area mm. in the interior of southern KwaZulu-Natal. Mm. Uh, in this particular area, they won 61% of the vote in 2016. In this by-election, the ANC got 16% of the vote. Mm. And the IFP uh, got just over, 6 uh, just over 5 over 5% of the vote in 2021. And they come and With shock 53. al Jamaa this new party, Cesar Umanation, and the ANC by getting over 50% of the vote. Mm. This should worry the ANC greatly because you're seeing the IFP win by elections in places like near Richards Bay in the Umklatuzi area. You're seeing them rebound in the 2021 local government elections in places like Newcastle in the traditional northern KwaZulu Natal areas. But now you're also seeing them win by elections in southern KwaZulu Natal, the heartland of ANC support in the province. Mm -hmm. If we look at the ANC, then it was a 27 percent now 16 but honestly that 53 percent currently from the 6 percent is a significant leap if we tried to to make sense of these numbers what exactly is happening politically if we look at what the electorate wants right now from the african national congress that it seems to be getting from the ifp what's happening there well, I think the leader of the IFP, Mr. Khlabisa, has spent a lot of time in southern KwaZulu-Natal over the last few years since he's emerged as the leader of the IFP, since he replaced Mangasu Tbutalezi. And that is clearly starting to pay dividends. But what we're also seeing is a lot of volatility. These numbers... These swings are not normal mm. to see a party go from 6% to 52%. Mm. And you said the ANC declined from 27% to 16%, but five years before that, the ANC got 61%. So I just want to, th these are dramatic drops for the ANC. And the numbers don't really, uh, it's hard to really put your hand on it. So the town of Harding, okay, the actual town of Harding, which is one of the two voting districts in the ward, the two parties who got 80% of the vote in this by-election, the IFP and the Cesare Uma Nation, what did they get a few months ago in November on the ballot? Nothing. Not mm. one vote. So you're seeing dramatic swings. Uh, we don't normally see these swings, and I think it speaks to the volatility uh, uh, and the turbulence in KwaZulu-Natal politics, but the party who's gaining the most from this turbulence is the Nkata Freedom Party. Mm -hmm. And Al Jamar being the biggest loser, honestly, I mean, from 52% to 1%. Let's bring in TK now. TK, what do you attribute this change to? Well, look, uh, I think, you're, as I think your guest has said, Wayne, that, look, you just have to look at the inner machinations of the ANC, especially in KZN. Look, uh, the trend, especially, I think, from the 2019 elections, that the IP has been going up and that there's there was always, I think, called the, uh, the JZ factor, which is to say, look, in the early years, he, his ascension to being president of the ANC actually brought a lot of good for the ANC in the province of, of KZN in the form of voters, you know, and that really, for a long time, ate away your traditional IFP voters. But I think, look, partly of what, what's happened with the, the exit of President Jacob Zuma as president, also partly what's happened with the ANC in that province in terms of, you know, the leadership changes and also the fact that the the house is quite divided. The IFP has been quite steady. They've seen a change in leadership generationally. If you, you don't just have to look at the president, you look at the whole IFP uh, leadership. There's a generational yes. ch change which has happened, which is a bit unique in South Africa because it's always the key issue of what happens to your traditional party when that one 
massive figure disappears. And it would seem as though the IFP, whether by by design or maybe the caught fire with it, has been able to do that. But again, and I think Mr. Wayne will probably be in a better position to answer me with that. If you look at what KZN represents for the bigger voting block in South Africa, if I'm not mistaken, that's where the largest number of, of votes uh, come from. And, uh, and then the, the largest voter base actually comes from. So it's actually quite an interesting development, but it will only become interesting. And it's, remember, that's one thing. It puts the question now or the onus on the IFP to say, you're doing well with these by-elections. You're doing well with the message that you're doing. But can this message travel to places like Etiquini? Can it travel to places like Marisburg, which are your more, you know, your, your urban areas in KZN? Because if they were to travel there, then we probably see, listen, this message can travel to maybe the Eastern Cape, growing places like Gauteng. So that's actually quite interesting for the IFP. But other political parties as well in case it didn't seem to really be taking a, a step back. And it's more interesting to find out why that's the case. Mm -hmm. Really interesting to find out. Perhaps you can delve into the politics of Al Jamaa. Why have we seen such a significant drop? Yeah, this is a quirk of Kozumtel politics that if I remember correctly, when the National Freedom Party wasn't on the ballot in the 2016 local government elections, uh, they were only on the ballot in one particular municipality, some of their members said, lend your vote to Al Jamaa. So you found this very unique situation in areas where there were very few, in Harding there are Muslim voters, or no, very few to no Muslim voters, people voted for Al Jamaa. I think what happened here in Harding was the local candidate, Sheikh, Tulani Inkani, mm. who is a very popular figure, well known in the town, and that is why people, they voted more for him than Al Jamaa. But what makes this by election so unique is that people decided to vote for the IFP more than him this time. Mm. Um, so I think that is significant. And by the way, if you go from 52% to 1%, Al Jamaa must be very worried about their, whether they'll return to that council in uh, 2024. Remember, they had the deputy mayor position after the local government elections now they are not the ANC will rather want to work with a party like the Bantu Boto Congress mm. I think they're more likely to be a stable coalition partner mm -hmm. although they got two percent they basically stayed the same but let's shift our focus now to the Western Cape some interesting developments there in Cedarburg talk to us about that and the whole floor crossing that we're seeing many people leaving this particular party and again thinking that as an individual if I defect to another party the electorate will follow me but it wasn't to be Correct. And this is, it's so important. We can look at numbers in by-elections, but we must always try and understand who are the candidates. So there's a lot of good, even though the Patriotic Alliance lost the ward, lost the by-election, there's a lot of good which came out of it. But this was a critical win, first of all, in the short term for the Democratic Alliance, because this win means that them and they and their coalition partners, a local party led by Dr. Ruben Richards called the Cederberg Eerste mm. and the Freedom Front, can now take back control of Cedarburg, which is on the west coast of the Western Cape. This also means that the DA has won a very important by-election. It will boost the confidence of their activists and boost the confidence of the party in the Western Cape. That they've now won three consequential by-elections by, by, by relatively narrow margins in a place like Van Reinsdorp, in a place like Prince Albert, and now in uh, Lambert's Bay. What these by-elections meant was that they either consolidated coalitions, were able to take control of Prince Albert and take back control of Cedarburg. It means that there's a more DA governments now in parts of the Western Cape. Mm -hmm. However, what will worry the DA, and I argue this in my latest article, which uh, will come out tomorrow, is that Gate and McKenzie and the Patriotic Alliance, in my opinion, are emerging as the most likely alternative um, if the DA are to fall under 50% in the Western Cape in 2024. Mm, this going. is a staggering result for them. Yes, they had the former DA uh, councillor, and who is very well known in Lambert's Bay. He was elected uh, on two different occasions. He was trying to get re-elected for a third time, a man called William Farmer. Yes, they fell short, but this was a very good result for the Patrick Alliance because they're now showing that we are able to grow exponentially and we are the most likely challengers to the DA in the 2024 elections. Mm. And then speaking of the Democratic Alliance, perhaps we can now talk about their five-point plan. Very interesting what we heard yesterday, perhaps as a start, to start with UTK. Just give us your take on the initiative itself to say, look, it seems as though coalitions are going to be a significant part of our future as early as 
2024. Let's start the conversation around refining South Africa's electoral, if we're looking at the electoral legislative framework right now, that perhaps it needs to be brought up to speed. What do you make of just the initiative to start the conversation? Well, I'll, answer, I'll probably just try to give this answer, which is to say, I think the conversation should have started, and it's good that the conversation has started. But I think it's a bit premature to take it to the level of saying, look, let's amend laws uh, for the country. And the reason I say this is, if you read the five-point plan, I think one of the five is what I, I seemingly agree with, the, the idea of setting up a, it's almost like a register or ombudsman for the, the purposes of saying, listen, let's actually start thinking about regulation of coalition governments. That yes. I agree with. Mm, the, the rest tribunal. of our setting threshold says, yes, yeah, a tribunal. That makes sense. But again, look, it's always in the finer details. Because if you look at the Kenyan one, it's actually a bit different to what the, the DA presented. What the Kenyan one says is that you come to this tribunal once you, as political parties, have said we're going into a coalition. And then you give this tribunal what you guys are going to be running on. And then that gets registered and that becomes legal. Now, this idea of already saying, OK, let's do this along that, aside that, let's put thresholds, which means that parties like the SADP, Jamal and others will just disappear off the face of the planet. I don't think that's the right way to go about it. So I agree with the conversation and I agree with one of the five points. Mm -hmm. But I think it's something which really needs to start you know, among political parties now and the rest of South Africa, because as this happened in South Africa, which we see from our political parties is especially the Democratic Alliance, what you do not win in chambers or what you do not win with, ele with the electorate, you want to take to the courts. And I think that's a very, it sets a very poor precedent. And I know the DA always goes on about, look, this, ha this happened in Germany, this happened in Germany. But you need to look at the, the, the conditions of Germany. In Germany, uh, the, the leading parties either go between 25, 24. In South Africa, for all the misery the ANC has brought upon people, the ANC is still at the 50% uh, threshold. So I think we need to really be a bit nuanced about this to say, yes, we welcome the discussion. Yes, the discussion needs to really start. But I think it's a bit premature to go to start changing laws for something that has not happened yet without a proper discussion, which ventilates and understands the South African context. But many analysts are already saying that this is the future, that perhaps we do need to start the conversation because just reading the five point plan, they firstly stated that this is not cast in stone. They're open to negotiations and refining this particular plan. But nevertheless, there must be something on paper that regulates these type of arrangements where you have coalitions. You also spoke of the one to two percent threshold that they speak of. That particular implementation of a threshold, from what I gathered there, it was perhaps to address the minority or smaller parties that then gain this kingmaker status more than the power they actually should wield if we had to look at the numbers that they bring to the table. You felt that that was not perhaps an answer to this issue of that kingmaker status with somebody having very, very few votes. Well, yes, and, and I'll say it in, in this regard. My argument is that the reason we're getting to coalitions in South Africa is not because that, listen, South Africans are crying for coalitions. It's simply because South Africans are crying for political leadership. So if we both and if we can agree that that's the reason why we're heading towards it, then the, the better question to ask is if we if there's a lack of leadership, should not those who are in this position now start to better regulate themselves to say, listen, how is it that this one party is able to really destabilize all of us? And I think one of the main reasons we're seeing it in places like the city of Joburg is because the DA does not and the ANC, they do not want to enter into an actual conversation among themselves to say, listen, if the both of us actually came together and sat down and really believe in the process of saying, let's actually help citizens by addressing what they want. And if this means going into a formal coalition, let's do it. This this one percent really means very little. But what we have instead is it's a scraping together, which is to say party X will say, listen, how do I get to the number 10? Well, I'll get you, I'll get half of you and I'll get half of you. And then down the line, you're surprised that, oh, my word, this this half percent I've brought into this so-called coalition is actually letting us down. So the issue for me is not that you need to really regulate this in the sense that let's make it more legalistic. The issue is to say be better as a political offering in the idea of a coalition so that when you actually think about coalitions, you've thought about it and you're giving people real alternatives and you're actually giving them leadership. Because what we're crying for in South Africa is political leadership, not necessarily to make this more legal. So that's where you, the DNI, the DNI, the DNI basically have a problem that I think we're looking at the problem in a very different way. They look at it as an issue of saying, how do you accumulate and make this legal? I'm saying, look, the issue is that there is no political leadership. And in the absence of this, you, this is why this 1% is always able to really almost take the rug under you. So start mm -hmm. with that and then go to a conversation about what does a coalition look like? Your take, Wayne? 
that we shouldn't put the legal framework first, but rather be functional as a coalition? Because some would say maybe they need to be bound to something, that let's have some sort of regulatory framework that they are bound to. Yeah, and no, I just want to first deal with something TK just said, which is interesting. This idea that the ANC and DA, for the greater good of the residents of Johannesburg, Ekuruleni, etc., should come together because they are the two largest parties. If I can just deal, I think that's a very interesting case, and I think TK is correct. But parties are also strategic animals. And if the ANC were to form a formal coalition of the DA, the EFF would jump all over that. If the DA had to enter into a coalition with the ANC, Action SA, the Freedom Front, uh, and the Patriotic Alliance would jump all over that. And I think that they would be punished at the polls, both parties, um, particularly the DA, if they had to enter into such a coalition. And this is the challenge in South African politics and back to the, regula uh, the regulatory frameworks. We can have frameworks, we can have mechanisms, but politicians will remain short-term orientated. Just what can I get for myself? Can I get the best possible position in the mayoral committee? If, I, if uh, the ANC or the DA offers me something better, I'll take my party out of the coalition and all the, the, the instability will continue. And... Uh, what will my supporters think in the short term? We need medium to long term orientation. Uh, politicians who have a medium to long term orientation in this country, who can cha deal with infrastructure challenges, who can deal with service delivery matters. And yes, it's important to have new regulatory frameworks, but politicians are not going to be long term orientated. And I see us, hopefully with TK again, having this conversation over and over again mm. about the instability of local government in South Africa. Let's hope politics. not. I hope to call you to say that, no, this is functioning as you thought. That right now, if they're inward looking, they need to start thinking about the citizens first and saying we need to make it work because it clearly is the future. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time this morning. That's TK Poe and Wayne Sussman talking to us on coalitions and particularly that five-point plan that many of us would have seen yesterday.